Ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll try to begin. We uh, we know we're a little bit pressed for time on each end, and so um, with apologies to those who are just coming in, uh, there are a number of seats on, on this side. There's also a couple on, on this side. My name's George Lopez. I have the privilege of being a vice president here for the academy at USIP with a lot of interest in UN peacekeeping and delighted to have this panel and this opportunity today, uh, both because of the theme of our of our conference. Obviously, you can't do serious peace building without there often being serious peacekeeping, and that's increasingly involved the United Nations, DPKO, and the progress we've made over the last two decades in this enterprise. Also, as many of you know, May 29th is the International Day of UN Peacekeeping, which has been declared by the General Assembly effective last year. So there's all sorts of reasons to analyze, celebrate, and talk about uh, what we're doing. Because of the time, I'm going to leave it to uh, the bios in the program to uh, remind you of who's here and their credentials. The one exception in the program is Tori Holt uh, from IO could not join us today because of her schedule. And I my, much gratitude to Rafi Gregorian of the Office of Peace Operations in State to join us to uh, talk about State's perspective on this. Our, our panel will proceed with um, Rafi, Peter, Oliver, and then Lee. So I begin and open with Rafi, and uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, George. Uh, in the interest of time, um, I'll, I'll try to go through this very quickly. Um, I've, I've just now excised a couple of paragraphs, but I've already wasted time telling you all that. So I'll just, I'll just, I'll just get on with it. I suppose the big surprise I had from uh, working on or preparing for this is that a lot of the work I did in Bosnia turns out to be peace building. I didn't even know that it, it had a name, but that, that's apparently a lot of what we do these days. I am, of course, uh, grateful to be here. I'm, uh, Tori sends her apologies. She's actually on an airplane returning from Addis Ababa, where she's been working on issues related to uh, renewal of the um, UN mission in South Sudan mandate. We think that's uh, coming to a, a, a positive conclusion in the very near future. Uh, I do want to talk to you briefly, I hope, about connection between peacekeeping and peace building. A formal connection emerged, indeed may only have become possible with the end of the Cold War and the expansion of multi-dimensional multi -dimensional UN peacekeeping that followed. I plan to speak briefly about our perspective as a member of the UN Security Council, I'm trying to develop tools to address evolving challenges to international peace and security. Unshackled from Cold War restraints, the Security Council struggled in the first half of the 1990s to address intrastate conflicts in places like Somalia and Rwanda, as well as the international armed conflicts that marked the breakup of Yugoslavia. But these challenges exceeded the capabilities of existing policies, practices, and tools available to the Security Council. In fact, does anyone here even remember the debate over whether UNHCR could help internally displace persons in the Balkans because they were not, in legal terms, refugees? Um, used to authorizing peacekeeping missions under Chapter 6 of the UN Charter to implement, not enforce, a peace agreement between warring states, the Council struggled in places where there was no peace to keep and failed to prevent genocide in Bosnia and Rwanda or to bring stability to Somalia. Similarly, NATO, whose members in the early 1990s discussed whether to dissolve the alliance, had to first agree that it could even act out of area before it could begin to support UN humanitarian assistance operations in the Balkans, let alone conduct airstrikes to enforce ceasefires. The UN, as well as NATO, had yet to develop policies and doctrines in the early 1990s that would allow them to address such situations, including through peace enforcement operations. With about half of all countries that emerged from war, particularly civil war, lapsing back into conflict within a short time, the Security Council needed new policies and doctrines to bring about the end to conflicts, a subject in its own right, but also to launch efforts to ensure that the resulting peace was sustainable over time. The incorporation of peacebuilding activities into UN peacekeeping operations was, in essence, the response to this set of challenges. Boutros Boutros Ghali's 1992 an Agenda for Peace was the seminal UN document that formalized the idea of peacebuilding as a feature of what we call today multidimensional peacekeeping. It's worth recalling what he wrote, quote, 
Peacemaking and peacekeeping operations to be truly successful must come to include comprehensive efforts to identify and support structures which will tend to consolidate peace and advance a sense of confidence and well-being among people. Through agreements ending civil strife, these may include disarming the previously warring parties and the restoration of order, the custody and possible destruction of weapons, repatriating refugees, advisory and training support for security personnel, monitoring elections, advancing efforts to protect human rights, reforming or strengthening governmental institutions, and promoting formal and informal process of political participation." Unquote. This description codified the elements of the UN Transitional Administration in Com Cambodia, or UNTAC, mandate from the year before, and influenced the mandates of the post-Dayton Accord missions in the former Yugoslavia, the UN missions in Sierra Leone, East Timor, and Kosovo, all launched in 1999. The 2000 Brahimi Report pointed out how peace building to prevent the recurrence of conflict and focus on long-term institution building and reconciliation and advocated for peacekeeping operations to lay the groundwork for peacebuilding activities from their inception. The report recommended quick impact, development-style projects to improve the lives of citizens and a focus on rule of law, DDR, and other activities to help post-conflict states rebuild their institutions. At the 2005 World Summit, member states emphasized the need for a coordinated, coherent, and integrated approach to post-conflict peacebuilding, creating the Peacebuilding Commission or PBC. The PBC was to be an intergovernmental body that would bring together all relevant actors, including international donors, international financial institutions, national governments, troop-contributing countries, and civil society representatives to coordinate efforts, marshal resources, and advise on integrated strategies for post-conflict peacebuilding and recovering, recovery, often at the tail end of a peacekeeping operation. Almost 10 years later, there is general consensus that the PBC has not quite lived up to its founding expectations. We have seen some successes in Sierra Leone, of course, and in Liberia, where the UN peacekeeping in, uh, mission in Liberia also remains. PBC efforts have focused on support for the government's justice, security, and reconciliation priorities, including regional justice and security hubs that provide basic services outside Monrovia. Yet the PBC has not been able to prevent violence in places such as the Central African Republic. The PBC's impact often depends on the personality of the individual chair for a country configuration. We know it is critical, for example, that the chair develops a strong and collaborative relationship with the SRSG of either a special political mission or peacekeeping mission in the country in order to be effective. We also know that successful peace building requires national ownership, social and political inclusivity, particularly the involvement of women, institution building, and sustained and predictable financing. Other aspects of the so-called peace-building architecture, the peace-building support office and the peace-building fund have been more successful. The PBF in particular has proven to be more nimble and able to quickly address needs on the ground in countries in crisis such as the Central African Republic. The UN will conduct a peace-building review coming up in two, uh, 2015, and we certainly look forward to using that to make our collective efforts more effective and relevant. But back to peacekeeping. In January of last year, the Security Council adopted Resolution 2086, which endorses a multi-dimensional approach to peacekeeping. The resolution notes to quote, the contributions that peacekeepers and peacekeeping missions make to early peace building and emphasizes, unquote, and emphasizes that UN peacekeeping activities should facilitate post-conflict peace building, prevention of relapse of armed conflict, and progress towards sustainable peace and development. I believe it also endorsed motherhood and apple pie. It calls on peacekeeping operations to help their host countries with peace building strategies. Some of the peace building activities it lays out include security sector reform, disarmament, demobilization, reintegration of former combatants, rule of law, mine action, and good offices for advancing political processes, much of the same things that Boutrous Boutrous Ghali laid out uh, some 10 years before. The resolution also notes the delivery of humanitarian assistance, the promotion of human rights, protection of civilians, and coordination with UN funds and agencies. But today's multidimensional peacekeeping operations certainly have more complex mandates that call for many of these peacebuilding activities. MINUSMA, or the Multidimensional Stabilization Mission in Mali, is mandated with supporting the reestablishment of state authority, but also with supporting the trans uh, implementation of the transitional roadmap 
and national dialogue, protection of civilians, promotion of human rights and support for humanitarian assistance, cultural preservation, national and international justice. Given these sorts of new tasks, outside of providing security, conducting patrols and monitoring ceasefires, we're learning that in these multi-dimensional integrated missions, the capacity of UN civilian staff with the right expertise is absolutely critical. Various entities are working to improve the recruitment and retention of the right personnel. The UN Civilian Capacity Review, Review or CIVCAP, is an attempt to address the challenges in a timely manner, a problem first highlighted in the Secretary General's 2009 report on peacebuilding. One question we pose to ourselves now is, has the pendulum with respect to peacebuilding and peacekeeping, uh, has the pendulum swung too far in that direction? Due to the violence in South Sudan in late 2013, we are having to alter course and revise the mission's prior mandate from one focused on capacity building and civilian protection and conflict resolution strategies geared towards low-level intercommunal tensions related to cattle raiding and so forth to basically suspending the state building activities in favor of its focus on physical security of civilians, facilitating humanitarian assistance, promoting human rights, and supporting a cessation of hostilities. And there has been some criticism among the very council members who determined these mandates, including the one on Central African Republic that was just adopted uh, uh, the other month, um, that the peacekeeping mandates today resemble Christmas trees with ornaments being hung on that favor various members of the council. Uh, there was a meeting not long ago in Edinburgh by political um, directors of the P5 countries, and this was one of the themes that came up on, over and over again, but apparently they didn't look in the mirror, including ourselves, because we are the ones that are doing this. We are the ones that are adding that uh, stuff now. I'm being told to end right now. Um, and the best, uh, so let me just uh, end on one final note, and that is about the focus that um, this, the council increasingly has on trying to transfer tasks from UN peacekeeping missions to parts of the UN country team. There's good reasons for considering that. Take UNDP present in 170 different countries. It's probably there before a conflict starts. It may well be there during a conflict, and it's probably going to be there long after the peacekeeping mission has left. Um, yet they receive a different uh, funding stream than the peacekeeping mission. So it's not easy to just have the council say, we'll transfer tasks from this peacekeeping mission to the UN country team, because that's essentially an unfunded mandate. The Security Council doesn't control the UNDP, for example. So easier said than done. The other thing is to be quite um, uh, explicit when, when the council is discussing the, the elements of the Security Council resolution and, and the mandate. MINUSCO, for example, twice now in the last, uh, the last two iterations of this, um, some of the members of the council, including uh, uh, from the United States, complained about the number of tasks that MINUSCO has, 80, 90, 100, whatever. Funny thing is when you do an actual um, uh, uh, assessment of it, what you'll find is about four or five core tasks. And the, the other tasks are really subsidiary implied tasks that come from that in terms of how the mission goes about uh, fulfilling those tasks. There's about, uh, you know, protection of civilians, security sector reform, and so on. Those are the main tasks and emphasis of the mission. So part of the, part of the challenge we have as council members, as I suggested just a minute ago, is to look in, look in the mirror and ask ourselves what kinds of things, what kind of ornaments do we really need to hang on this Christmas tree? Bear in mind that the, the Security Council resolution that uh, endorsed um, the UN uh, operation in Congo in 1960 was four paragraphs long. The one on CAR, I think we just passed, was like eight or nine pages. Thank you very much. Rafi, thank you so much uh, for that tight, synthetic presentation. Uh, in an attempt to get the panel off quickly, I not only forgot my colleague and friend Allison at the end of the table, but also forgot to mention that she's going second. Um, and, and now that she has plenty of time to prepare for that, I'm happy to turn it over to Allison. I love surprises. Okay, um, how's the volume level? Good? Great. Um, so I'm with the Stimson Center, and uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to cut out a lot of the examples that I was going to give. Um, just to let you know, I just got back from Congo a week and a half ago. I was in the Central African Republic two months ago, and I was in South Sudan in November. So if you have questions about those, and Mali in September. So if you have questions about those specific things, please bring them up in Q&A. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple different things, which are um, uh, 
interrelated, and I'm going to uh, specifically speak to some of the challenges, which is probably why I'm going second, so the more positive views can come after me. Um, I'm going to talk about peace building, state building, and stabilization, and I'm going to talk about some of the challenges of what that means from the international, national to local level, because that's a lot of, those are where the challenges often arise. And then I'm going to talk really quickly about the tensions and trade-offs between those goals, which are more longer-term goals, and protection of civilians, which is more an immediate, imminent um, goal. So first of all, on the peace building, which I'm talking about sort of the negotiations all the way through to um, getting the peace agreement signed and then through implementation. Um, and one of the challenges that has been identified by a number of academics and practitioners is that the international community tends to come into these conflict situations with a macro level view. They tend to not often get the interrelated nature of the macro level um, peace and conflict dynamics with the subnational and the local. And of course, of course, those are key to breaking cycles of violence. When you get down to the national level, um, you have a political affairs unit, and I'm going to count on Oliver for uh, correcting me on anything, but I'm trying to keep things a little bit simplistic. Um, you have a political affairs unit that often works very much at um, their smaller units, and they tend to often work at sort of the national level of trying to get laws um, passed or encourage that sort of national level reform. And it can often be disconnected from um, things that happen at the local level and the subnational level around conflict. So for example, early warning systems and also um, uh, the civil affairs, which happens, uh, it's really the sort of conflict negotiation and mediation that happens at the very local level. And hopefully those are larger components in missions, but those aren't always connected in a communication or in a, str in a strategic planning um, sort of way. Uh, also, I think it's really important to mention here that peacekeeping operations have relatively little leverage in comparison to uh, member states who are donors and also who have been very involved in um, brokering peace agreements. And we can talk a little bit how to mitigate that when we get to the Q&A, if you're interested. Um, but that's really important when it comes to the actual implementation of these macro-level peace agreement. Um, I was mentioning the civil affairs, which are, are the folks that are down at the local level really doing sort of the conflict prevention mitigation and in some places play a big role in protection of civilians. Uh, Rafi was mentioning the civilian capacities review. Um, this is in part coming because peacekeeping operations find it very difficult to recruit the right civilians to fill a lot of these roles with the right trainings. Sometimes peacekeeping operations tend to be more top-heavy, and those top-heavy positions tend to be more expensive. There are less people who are willing to sort of go out into these really conflict-affected areas where you don't have as nice of um, living standards and um, latrines and those sorts of things. And those are the kind of foot soldiers, as far as civilians are concerned, that we really need out there serving inside company operating bases and forward operating bases um, on the front line. And one of the positive things is that the UN is getting much better at developing those sorts of capacities, like what are called community liaison systems that also help with language um, as well as culture, because they're people who are hired from the ground. Um, on state building, now state building is an interesting term because it sometimes is about the extension of state authority, which can be everything from flying state authorities from the capital out to where the people that they actually represent, but it also includes things like capacity building, technical assistance, and technical advice. And I'll let somebody else uh, try and uh, talk about what the differences between those things are, but I would raise the fact that um, I don't know that it's really clear what the differences are between the, that language that is put into a mandate. And it's left to the peacekeeping operation to really sort that out. But when you get down to the local level and you're talking to an individual police officer that is co-located with police on the ground and are supposed to be doing that capacity building, technical advice, technical assistance, there's often a lot of confusion about how you um, sort of play that role of trying to get the buy-in of what are often very low capacity uh, um, police officers uh, and, and be mentoring them. At the same time, you're supposed to be sort of reporting on what they might be doing that isn't representative, that isn't about protection of civilians, et cetera. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit right now just to talk about how that state building um, works between the peacekeeping operation and the UN agencies, which Rafi also brought up. Um, as 
there are these, uh, they're supposed to be working very closely together in order to do the state building. The UN agencies are doing the more development focused stuff through UNDP and also humanitarian activities. Uh, they do come up with integrated strategic frameworks and plans, but unfortunately those don't always work on the ground. And one of the problems, of course, is that they're funded different, but there are also other interoperability issues. I mean, they don't share the same email systems. They don't often have uh, phone rosters of people who are sitting in bases next door to them. And so they can't communicate in um, the ways that they need to in the actual implementation of this stuff on the ground. Some of it's that simple, some of it's much larger. Um, what is supposed to happen is you have a large civilian component doing police corrections is that they may be working in one area geographically or issue wise and then a UN agency is doing the other things but what, and, and when it works well that's the way it works but what we often see is turf battles and we see a lot of miscommunication both at the national level and the local level and so it's hard both when you have both of them on the ground as well as when you're trying to do the trade-off that was being talked about. The third thing I'll talk about is um, offensive force and stabilization. Peacekeeping operations are more and more having this S in their mandate, the stabilization terminology. And that means that we're moving more towards not having the crouched reactive defensive sort of deterrent role, but also doing offensive things to try and clear areas of armed actors. Now, some of this, they say, is for protection of civilians, but often it's just to um, sort of, rather than just deter by sitting there and using force when somebody comes up to you, it's about going out and compelling, and even in the in, in the terms that have been used, at least in MINUSCO's mandate in Congo, neutralizing. Now, neutralizing doesn't mean wiping them out with force. It means simply... Um, putting enough pressure on them with a combination of force and politics that you get them to sort of give up the guns and come to the peace table, hopefully, um, or just give up the guns. Um, but uh, what we don't have are really the forces and the kinds of equipment that we need to be doing this kind of proactive military force. There isn't the command and control that you would have in a, in a national military force where there's um, similar language, similar doctrine, similar training. Um, you have often infantry battalions coming that are used to more static approaches to military operations versus more proactive, where we need more like special forces to go out there and do that kind of thing. Um, there's also really little tolerance for the kind of unintended consequences that come from offensive use of force. Even in places like Afghanistan, there's very little um, appetite for civilian casualties, but in a peacekeeping operation, the, the credibility and the legitimacy of the mission really depends on not harming people um, and protecting people. And so that creates an extra burden. Um, they're also very slow at deploying and moving, in part because of the way in which troops are generated and the way in which they're deployed, but also because of the fact that they're running under logistics that are really a civilian logistics support system versus a military. If they can't deploy quickly, think of the expectations that come up in the Central African Republic or South Sudan when DPKO, the Department of Peacekeeping Operations says they can deploy troops in two to three weeks, and it actually takes four months to a year. In that break, you get uh, not just the civilians, but also the, the armed actors that are no longer being deterred, and, and it creates force protection issues for the military. Last, with tensions of POC and state building and peace building. When I think of peace building and state building and stabilization, that is something that is going to require a long time, a decade, two decades, three decades, the security sector reform, the elections, etc. And often this gets conflated with protection of civilians. I want to be really clear that when people think about protection of civilians and the credibility and legitimacy of the mission, they're talking about protection from imminent threat of violence. They're talking about protection from hundreds of women being raped. And um, even though the uh, Department of Peacekeeping Operations and DFS have put together a much clearer concept that protection means both using political, it's not just a military thing, it's about imminent threat from physical violence, and it's about environment building. Whether we like it or not, it's really about imminent threat of, of um, physical violence. And as we know, state building 
um, often actually, and, and peace negotiations can actually cause violence. And because I have the end now sign, I can talk more about that in Q&A. But if you think about it, elections, um, decentralization of power, breaking war economies, um, use of force, even peace negotiations where military trying to jockey for more power, all can actually increase violence in the short term. And there needs to be ways to be thinking about that as you're doing your longer building, um, peace building and state building work. Thanks. Thanks so much, Allison. We turn to Peter. Great. Well, uh, thank you for uh, having me today. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how peacekeeping is being integrated into the global discussions about the goals that will follow the Millennium Development Goals and then how UN peacekeeping can be an important implementing uh, force uh, to, uh, as we think about making the next set of goals a reality. Um, there are seven countries in the world that are unlikely to meet even one of the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, six of those are considered fragile countries. So when we think about the successes of the Millennium Development Goals um, in terms of ending extreme poverty, increasing access to education and health care, um, it's clear that there are hundreds of millions of people that have been left out of it. And in fact, when you think about the fact that there are 400 million people in fragile states living in extreme poverty, and that number hasn't budged since 1990, uh, which was the beginning of the Millennium Development Goals. So while the rest of the world has seen enormous growth, 700 million people have been lifted out of poverty as a result of the Millennium Development Goals. You have not seen this progress at all in fragile states. So. And USAID put out a paper earlier this year that put it succinctly, which is a country that experienced major violence over the period from 1981 to 2005 has an extreme poverty rate 21 percentage points higher than a country with no violence. So this is the frame under which the various groups that are writing the world's next development goals are considering uh, these goals, whether it's the high-level panel or the open working group both of whom have suggested peace and security goals as part of the new framework that we're going to consider development um, and, uh, and, and human rights issues moving forward. Um, it is not a slam dunk that peace and security uh, will be considered and approved as a development goal um, as we think about 2015. Um, but we do know that we're off to a good start. The Secretary General's high-level panel, which put together 30 eminent people from around the world, recommended not one, but two peace and security goals uh, be adopted by the world. The first is ensure stable and peaceful societies. The second one is ensure good governance and effective institutions. Um, and the panel stressed that, and I quote, freedom from fear, conflict, and violence is the most fundamental human right an essential foundation for building peaceful and prosperous societies. So as they think, as they were thinking about what are the targets that you would implement these very broad goals, they talked about increasing the capacity, professionalism, and accountability of security forces, military forces, and the judiciary, uh, as well as reducing violent deaths, as well as reducing the external stressors that lead to conflict. So the, the, the high level panel was not only thinking about how you write the goals, but then how you measure them 15 years from now. The open working group, which is taking the work of the high-level panel to the next stage, is actually the member states themselves. And this is a group that is considering, um, at the moment, 16 focus areas, of which one, which is peaceful and inclusive societies, rule of law, and capable institutions. And itself, and the open working group itself has put together a series of draft uh, targets that they would measure, the world would measure our progress on that front. Um, I think the third element to consider as we think about what is a very much more open process that these development goals are being considered is the UN Development Program is running global consultations around the world. Every country in the world is, almost every country in the world has had thematic consultations about what people want in the next development goals. The My World Survey, which is an online survey, has uh, reached over 2.1 million people. Um, and what's interesting is, is that an honest and responsive government is third in terms of what people are looking for in terms of global goals, and protection from violence and crime is seventh. 
both of these are, in the scheme of things, fairly high rankings in terms of the My, My World survey. So it's clear that as we think about peace building and we think about uh, um, building stable societies, that in fact uh, we're pushing it on open door as it relates to what people around the world want. But as I said, it's not a slam dunk. There is a lot of opposition to peace and security and stability and governance goals um, as uh, that are in this global process. Um, some critics believe that uh, these goals are tantamount to the securitization of development. Others think it's an encroachment on internal affairs. Uh, others believe that these security issues are best left to the Security Council. So there is still opposition, but um, I remain relatively optimistic, in part because the United States has been aggressively pushing for peace and security goals as well as um, good governance goals, that in fact there's going to be something at the end of the day that we can point to. So as we think about uh, peacekeeping, it's important to remember that peacekeeping is an important implementing partner uh, as uh, in terms of securing peace in fragile states and implementing what will hopefully be global goals as it relates to peace and security. Uh, you know, as Kofi Annan suggested in his In Larger Freedom report, um, uh, the peacekeeping and peace building really do need to be simultaneous activities, and both Rafi and Allison have outlined how the multidimensional peacekeeping missions that we're seeing today are very different than we were seeing 10 years ago, where peacekeeping was much more focused on maintaining a ceasefire line between two warring parties, two warring countries that had agreed to end their fighting, and somebody needed to monitor the ceasefire. Uh, UN peacekeeping has moved on uh, uh, extensively since then, and all the new missions that are coming online are far more complicated and, in fact, do exactly what Kofi and I called for, which is multidimensional peacekeeping where you have uh, peacekeepers and other UN partners uh, working to develop uh, reconciliation processes, good governance, human rights, at the same time that they are providing the security environment that allows there to be peace and reconciliation, and most importantly, a political process to develop so that there's local ownership of the solutions uh, that are ultimately agreed to. So peacekeepers today are not only about providing the security environment that allows the pol politics to, to get right, but they're also about um, the broader set of activities uh, that can be undertaken. Um, just two examples, which is I went to Timor-Leste uh, as right after the Indonesian troops had pulled out uh, and uh, saw the unbelievable uh, physical devastation and human devastation that had been caused in Timor-Leste. Um, and uh, it, it was exciting when peacekeepers were deployed, and it's even more exciting that in 2012, after 13 years, the peacekeepers have left because they did their job. When you look at Timor-Leste today as a good partner and a good neighbor to Indonesia and to Australia, it w nobody would have predicted 13 years ago that Timor-Leste would have good relations with Indonesia and Australia is on the right side of development. When you look at the indicators in Timor-Leste in terms of education, politics, elections, it's all headed in the positive direction. So that is certainly a case where um, you saw peacekeepers and peace building happening at the same time uh, under the same umbrella was close coordination between all sets of UN partners. Uh, I just want to mention Central African Republic is a challenge as we think about the deployment of peacekeepers there. Uh, you know, it is going to be multidimensional. And what's interesting in Central African Republic is that their Security Council and has clearly indicated there's going to be a very large need for a civilian component as part of the peacekeepers there. So it will not just be deployed military, deployed police that are providing security in Central African Republic. It's going to be an extensive civilian force uh, that is working on the broader set of peace building activities that will ultimately determine whether we're going to have a similar success story there or not. I would just note that from an American perspective, we have a challenge, which is that for the first time, time since 2009, the U.S. has returned to arrears in U.N. peacekeeping. We currently owe or by the end of the year, we'll owe $350 million to the United Nations. So we're in arrears again. Uh, and uh, this is a huge challenge as we think about America's role. Um, and it's important that as we think about the FY15 appropriations process that we fully fund UN peacekeeping. So 
Uh, just to wrap up, as we think about the next 15 years, the next development goals, uh, it's quite clear that building peaceful and just societies, uh, including the full range of peace building activities, um, that it's important that they be included as part of these global goals, whatever they're called, Millennium Development Goals, Part 2, Sustainable Development Goals, or something else that another PR firm comes up with in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, because right now we refer to it as the post-2015 process, which is just dry as toast. Uh, and uh, so um, it's important, though, that peace and stability be part of these goals. And as we think about the targets that are going to be part of the goals, that UN peacekeeping has got to be uh, viewed as a, not the sole, a core element in terms of its implementation. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, along with Rafi, Oliver has joined us as uh, a, a late time stand in coming from New York uh, just before to, to be part of our operation. We're very delighted to have you. Thank you. Um, thanks very much, and thanks for inviting DPKO. Um, and I'm glad I was able to jump in at the last minute. Apropos, I like surprises. I managed to jot down a few things on the way here. So um, going forth has the benefit of me not having to repeat some of the very good points Rafi made, um, and also maybe being able to rebut some of the points that Alison made. <laughs> Correct, maybe not rebut, but I'll try to still stay within my, my 10 minute uh, time slot. Um, I'm glad Rafi mentioned 2086, um, which was passed last January, because we do see that particular resolution as the sort of high watermark and hopefully um, final word from the council and um, therefore for the New York community of, of delegates and, and secretariat colleagues on the linkages. Um, it, pre it was preceded by two or three years of consensus building and quite a lot of debates inside the New York peacekeeping and peacebuilding community, um, and I think it reflects extremely well how we see and how the Council uh, now sees the linkages between uh, those two general categories. Um, it's also important to note that it was passed under the presidency of Pakistan, um, and it, for us, was quite significant that one of the largest traditional troop contributors um, played that role. Um, I don't think it could have passed um, potentially under a different presidency. Um, uh, at least um, a couple of the P5s, I think, would, would have found it much more difficult to, to pass that resolution. Um, and it represents, I think, that the a total shift in the approach of some of our larger TCCs towards their role as peace builders. I think if you had asked Pakistan and some of the others three or four years ago, um, do you think peacekeepers are early peace builders? They would have immediately found that a fairly problematic proposition that would dilute their role as military um, uh, uh, TCCs and, and um, would potentially divert funding in a different direction, et cetera. But I think they've really embraced um, the concept of peacekeepers as early peace builders. Um, the resolution also um, talks very specifically about the three different roles that we have been, have been talking about before that peacekeepers perform vis-a-vis -vis peace building. A, a strategy formulation role that brings together the national government, the mission country team, and other partners around a shared sense of priorities um, for peace building, an enabling role where we create an environment where other peace building actors can actually perform um, their role primarily through the security umbrella that we hopefully provide, and last but not least, a role of direct implementation where peacekeepers themselves implement uh, a number of peace building tasks, and many of them have been mentioned. I won't repeat them. Um, it is important for us to keep reminding delegates in New York of that resolution and um, that consensus because you'd be surprised how new delegates, um, including among council members, come to New York and immediately hear about peace building being talked about in the context of the PBC, the PBSO, and the so called peace building architecture, which I think is a very unfortunate term. Um, because it includes so many other actors if it if it was really supposed to be the architecture that aren't in in the in the construct created in 2005 um, so we con constantly have to remind them that peace building is something that peacekeepers do and uh, which they do in countries that are not on the peace building agenda which is almost all of the countries where we have peacekeeping missions um, the second point I quickly wanted to talk about is um, how a peace building lens or a peace building perspective makes us better peacekeepers. Um, 
I think one, one thing that peace building has done, and going back all the way to the agenda for peace um, and the formulation in, in that document in 92, is to focus our minds on one of the primary purposes, or probably the primary purpose of us being in, in those countries, is to reduce the relapse, uh, the risk of relapse into conflict and, and, and create a trajectory where peace can be self-sustaining. That's obviously much, much uh, easier said than done but I do think that the peace building lens and the, 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 the focus on conflict drivers and, and related factors has helped us in our early strategic planning and, and conflict analysis to prioritize within um, the, the Christmas tree mandates um, that, uh, that Rafi was referring to on, on issues that, that are likely to uh, uh, cause a relapse either while we're there or after we leave. Um, we also know from the literature and from 20 years of experience with multidimensional um, peacekeeping, um, that two of the most important causes of relapse are um, insufficiently inclusive political settlements and processes and weak institutions. Um, and I think, again, the institution building part of what we do um, has probably risen in prominence over the last uh, couple of decades, um, maybe even the last few years in particular. Um, there's some doubts now being expressed about what exactly our role should be vis-a-vis -vis institution building, but I think if you look at our mandates, they are full of institution building tasks um, and getting better at how we build those institutions um, uh, in a way that's legitimate, sustainable, et cetera, is, is obviously a huge challenge, but something that I think the peace building lens has helped us focus on. Um, the peace building lens also helps us, um, I think, uh, be very clear about the collective endeavor that is peacekeeping and peace building and the need to work very, very effectively um, with a very broad range um, of actors that have to address all of the recurring peace building priorities that were first articulated in the 2009 SG's report are more or less reflected in the five peace and state building goals and from the international dialogue um, and are almost, again, identical to what the WDR um, on, on conflict, peace, and development articulated um, two or three years ago. Um, there's a remarkable consensus of what those recurring priorities are, um, uh, and uh, it's pretty clear that we need to uh, pursue them concurrently um, in a prioritized and sequenced way, but um, neglecting one at the expense of the other um, has, has had some pretty dire consequences, and I'll come back to that um, in a second. Um, a few challenges I wanted to um, uh, run through that um, we see from New York and the perspective of, of our missions. Obviously, the most important challenge that can um, reverse gains uh, very, very quickly and roughly refer to uh, the events in South Sudan um, is to make sure that the political process, settlement, deal, whatever you want to call it, is sustained and becomes increasingly inclusive um, and um, is seen as legitimate um, by the key actors and hopefully a growing percentage of, of the general um, population. And I agree with Allison that um, our leverage uh, can be quite limited, but it's not limited from the start. It declines over time. Um, missions and other international actors are in the same in the same position, I would say. Once you've run through one or two or even three election cycles, um, uh, quite understandably, the national leadership in, in a particular country is much less inclined um, to listen to what we have to say about how they should run their political uh, process, how much they should reach out to marginalized groups, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that is a, a significant problem in many cases, even in cases in places where we've been for 10, 10 to 15 years. Um, Second, um, I already alluded to uh, the institution building uh, mandates that we have and the capacity building mandates. We can maybe come back to that in the Q&A, but how do we get better at building those institutions? It's a hugely difficult task that we know takes 30 to 40 years. What is our role exactly in getting those institutions onto the right track? Not all institutions, but within the rule of law, within the human rights area, within the electoral um, areas, sort of the core institutions that PCB missions tend to be mandated to, to help uh, build. Um, and then how can we get better at coordinating more effectively across the various international actors that um, always play uh, a major role, um, including, of course, uh, uh, some of the P5 members that have a significant role to play on the ground, um, the World Bank, the EU, um, other bilaterals, uh, China in many cases, um, et cetera. 
Um, and how do we do that in a way that helps us cut across the, the political security uh, development silos that will always be there to some extent? Um, but I think we've uh, known for a long time that we need to integrate those streams much more effectively. Um, it will always be an uphill struggle. Um, the New Deal and the compacts that have come out of it have tried to um, move us in that direction. And I think we've done better in a number of countries than in others. Somalia, I think, is a good example. Mali, probably not such a great example. We're trying to improve on on the way it has been working in Mali in the case of CAR. Um, it's only a different different kind of circumstance, but um, still, still very important to, to get that right. Um, and one challenge we've had, I think, since Cambodia and probably before, <clears throat> is the, develop, the development actors that we depend on um, to move in after we create, for example, um, a more secure environment in some of the more remote areas are incredibly slow. Um, uh, and they're incredibly difficult to influence um, at times when they're not in the process of planning um, and prioritizing. Um, and their planning time frames are incredibly long. Um, so if you're talking to the Commission of the European Union in day five of their seven year uh, uh, planning uh, time frame and uh, asking them to reprioritize something, it's a difficult conversation. The same with the World Bank. The NDP is more flexible, but it's a, it's a huge challenge, um, particularly the speed with which they're able to move in when we need them to. For us, the holy grail really is early alignment. Um, oh, and now. Early alignment um, across these different actors, and we're trying very hard to to uh, achieve that in CR, where the key development actors are lining up, um, hopefully behind the, the the priorities agreed across across the board. Um, I was going to talk a little bit, um, but I've run out of time about one particular mandate area that uh, Allison also mentioned: extension of state authority. We're doing a bit more work in New York and with our missions on. What experience have we had with that? How can we get better at that? How can we strike the right balance between the center and the periphery? How can we strike the right balance between the different mandates we have um, and how they how they uh, uh, interplay? How can we extend state authority without undermining reconciliation and political processes? Events in, in Kedal over the last weekend um, are a reminder of how difficult that can be. Um, and um, I'll probably have to stop there. Um, <coughs> just one last point. Um, I completely agree with Rafi that we need very strong civilian components and strong staff to perform these roles. Um, uh, there's been a bit of a tendency in New York in the budgetary committees to question why we need all these civilians. Uh, uh, couldn't we just go back to basics? I think that's a dangerous uh, proposition and unhelpful uh, since we know since the early 90s that you cannot succeed in peacekeeping without um, those elements. Um, and uh, last, lastly, um, uh, related also to some comments before, um, a challenge that, that we're, I think, getting better at dealing with is when, when is it the right time for us to exit and transition out? And, and I don't particularly like the word handover because many things we do cannot be handed over to a UNDP uh, office. Uh, but when, how do we uh, exit in a way that's responsible, not too early, um, and, and allows the the political and institution building and, and other processes to continue without too much interruption. I think we've done that quite well in a couple of recent cases, and we're hopefully going to do it well in a couple of other places that are on that trajectory. Thanks. Thanks so much, Oliver. If we began with a U.S., but then global perspective, it's appropriate that we end with Tiwa, who's come the furthest from Beijing, to be with us to share her perspective and this is, uh, in my experience, one of the uh, uh, most synthetic analysts of a Beijing perspective. So we're delighted you were able to join us. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us. And uh, I will especially thank my um, research partner from AFSC, from New York, Andrew, bring me here, and also USIP and FP holding such a great event for me to um, feel very privileged here to communicate with you. And it's uh, really a pity for me that I haven't been to any of these fragile states. And as Alison mentioned, men mentioned those countries, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I will just say basically, specifically based on the China perspective, talking about peacekeeping and peace building, the policies and the, some other challenges we might, we might confront it in the near future. And first uh, question I would like to, to talk and share is uh, some interests 
specifically shaping Chinese engagement abroad, especially those kind of uh, military um, or peace operations. And I will just analyze it from three layers uh, in terms of the interest. Firstly, is uh, you know everybody knows that China has greatly expanded our national interests everywhere throughout the world. And uh, so we need to protect our national interests uh, abroad. And uh, also, you know, in terms of those kind of peace operations, there is another kind of analysis that uh, China, mostly in the peaceful uh, time, still need to train our military and uh, probably peacekeeping uh, those kind of NATO sy sy uh, system way would be the best solution for China to train our troops during the uh, peacetime, and we call it uh, something like uh, military operations, not for war. You know that would be the real and um, very substantial interest for China. And second layer is that uh, it's about this kind of uh, in international norm building or institution. Um, participation for China. And uh, as for in the UN studies, we normally will divide uh, to several different types as for, you know, a country would, would be a supporter to a norm or would be a reformer or would abandon or violate um, a norm or institution. As for China, it remains to be a really um, hard problem or, or option to choose because now we have really kind of dual identity here. Uh, on one hand, we can be considered as developing country and on the other, China has been categorized into the developed one to some extent. So uh, we need to firstly confirm what we are and then we can choose you know, how we should reform, uh, how we should follow, uh, how we can cooperate with the other main actors on the world stage. And the third, if we consider about the image of China, now we emphasize a lot about being a responsible great power. And I guess some of you might heard uh, about this concept, though it's very complicated. And I think we can put everything into this basket a responsible great power, but it has been uh, underlined uh, repeatedly in our foreign policy making. And also there is something like uh, called China, uh, uh, un uniquely Chinese or uniquely unique, you know, yeah. I think it's very interesting to, uh, to, to just define uh, like chi ch China model or uh, something in terms of it. And uh, I will quote Civil World's report in terms of this issue. And it, it just uh, compares China together with the other Western countries. And uh, it is said that, uh, uh, you know, China is kind of one of humanitarian and development aid plus influence without interference in contrast to the West coercive approach of sanction plus military intervention. So I think it partly explained the uh, questions, but not in a full picture. And also sometimes we would be, uh, it would be boiled down that China pay attention to those kind of commercial together with humanitarian uh, approach uh, in our uh, intervention or participation in those peace operations. And sometimes it was called pragmatism, Chinese pragmatism in uh the involvement. And second question I would like to, to discuss is the uh, routine cause of the conflicts in the fragile states. I think it's very important to, uh, to address this problem is that we firstly need to know, you know, what composes to be the, the most important variables and then we can decide how we give the medicines. So firstly, I think most important is the political system of those fragile states. And just now I remember that Peter mentioned that uh, there are about six, there are about six um, fragile states according to some index. But according to the G7 plus framework, now there are already 18 countries involved in this framework. So I think, you know, things might be even worse than what we have expected. And we, we have also witnessed that the political systems in those countries are not very, I will say, not very similar with uh, um, with the Westerns, uh, but uh, I still think that it, 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 it shouldn't be necessarily democratic because I have heard a lot of democratic elections this morning, but I, I don't think it would be the 
it should be the primary uh, goal or ultimate goal. Second, I think resources are very important. And uh, there is a kind of thinking that for those fragile states or for those kind of a, a conflict affected states, we, we have seen the two extremities. One is that the country is abundant with resources and there would be really huge wars and whatever civil wars or like interference or intervention from the outside. And the other would be the countries that are really short of everything. Yeah, just like, uh, um, like, uh, we, we say poor or, or deficit, whatever. And so it, 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 we also need to pay attention to that too. The third one, I think historical background also composes to be an important factor. Uh, to those countries. As for China has quite similar history with those countries, sometimes we have those kind of uh, common understandings with the um, mostly African countries. And the third question I would like to talk is about our attitude. Yeah, and I think after I have listed those uh, routine causes, and I think um, if we would like to solve the problem, we should just address the root causes first. And then, in PKO, China has got a very consistent policy in it. And uh, also, it's the, I think, the three pillars um, initiated, um, proposed by Hamashelt, whole state con consent, impartiality, non-use of force. We still stick on that. And also, at the same time, we just increase our contribution to UN peacekeeping um, from, from, from the new, new century millennium. And we have uh, seen that China has been the greater, greatest contributor among the P5 states. And at the same time, we still uh, will contribute more, both financially and in personnel way. And uh, uh, some of our colleagues mentioned PBF. Though the fund hasn't got a really big um, pool now, but China has consistently donated probably one million annually and from 2006. And I've, uh, it is uh, anticipated that China will keep increasing our financial contribution for peacekeeping. Before we were about 3% and now we were, we were almost at 6. Probably in the future we are going to close to 7 or 8% uh, to that extent. Uh, for peace building, uh, Hu Jintao has already mentioned that we should uh, jointly consider peacekeeping and peace building. For example, like uh, we prefer those kind of comprehensive approach, including security, civilian, administrative, political, humanitarian, human rights, and economic tools. And um, I found that it was also proposed by some of our European colleagues, this comprehensive approach. And the fourth thing I would like to talk is uh, about the challenges and risks we con confronted. Domestically, I think first thing I need to mention <coughs> is, the, is the domestic political stability in China. Though, you know, when we mention the fragile states, we, we just uh, care a lot about their stability. And now China has got the, you know, th this problem too. You know, we, we need to have uh, this stability first. And the second is our own economic growth. Could we just sustain the really fast speed of growth or not? still remains to be a question. Third is uh, environment degradation. And for most of the Chinese now, we don't care about number at all, like 10% GDP growth. But we have seen, and especially in Beijing, we have heard the, 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 the smog there. It, it hurts a lot, and people are becoming to consider about about those things. And fourth is terrorism and separationists. Now also, you know, has just a... Uh, put a lot of threat to Chinese security. Internationally, I think first thing we need to, okay, is uh, I will be very brave. First is the ge geographical conflicts with our neighboring countries. I, I found some American experts mentioned that the biggest problem for China is that we have too many neighbors. And now it, it just they got the problem now, whatever on the seaside and also on our um, territory board. And the second is the mutual con trust with our partners, whatever Western partners and African partners. And third is the our skills and expertise in UN and I.O. And since I have been working in universities for several years, it has been just great demand for from our government and from also UN. You know, China should 
just have a more you know skillful and、uh, well trained students and expertise in that field, and that's probably the things I would like to share. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we we we've had a group of talented panelists with a lot more to say. Be very disciplined and in in. Uh, very focused in their comments, so I'd ask for the ten minutes that we have for some Q and A that you respond appropriately and be focused in your question, both in uh, sparing uh, a particular talk before you pose the question, and if you would like to、uh, address it to a particular panelist, please do so. I'm going to take three or four、uh, on the ledger, and then we'll go、we'll、start over here. It looks like the front row demands attention with the hands, so please. Yeah, just first of all, thank you for all your presentations. My name is Kieran Singh, and I come from the International Storytelling Center here in the United States.、Um, my th- my question is really about the idea of、um, the cultural dimension to peacekeeping and peace building, and the idea does mention of the Millennium Development Goals and the twenty post fifteen, but within the Millennium MDG Goals, there was no mention of culture. Can, th- can thinking about How conflicts arise, where they come from, centuries past and more recent, and the cultural dimensions of that. And I'm wondering if what your views might be in terms of the role of culture and the arts, particularly now that we're in the middle of slap bang in the middle of the digital age. We heard a presentation about the gaming industry, social media. So your all your think your thoughts on culture and the arts in moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. This gentleman right here in the front row. Thank you.、Uh, my name is Ted Johnson, and I teach、uh, in the master's program on conflict and coexistence and sustainable international development at Brandeis.、Uh, m- many of you have spoken about、uh, the, the whole idea of multi-dimensional approaches and the whole idea of good governance, and I think it might have been Oliver that talked about、uh, one of the challenges of being the whole issue of、um, building better institutions. So, what I mean, I know there's a lot of literature on this, but just from your experiences, when you talk about better institutions and this Christmas tree analogy, that you can't build everything all at once. There must be some recommendations or some good practices that talk about prioritizing. Where do you start in that whole area? Thank you, Doris. Next here. No. Thank you. Um, I'm Doris Mariani, Chief Executive Officer of Nonviolent Peace Force. We do something called unarmed civilian peacekeeping, and we have about 225 people on the ground, 125 in South Sudan today, doing a very difficult task of protecting civilians. So my question to the panel is, and and we are you know fortunate to be working alongside UN peacekeepers and UNMIS and working with UNICEF and UNHCR. My my question to you is, UN peacekeeping is expensive and、um, it takes a long time to deploy the uh, uh, the missions,、uh, and you've all emphasized the importance of the civilian component. I'd like to hear your views. How the civilian component could be scaled up? What does it take to either uh, uh, make our organization or any organization? I don't care who it is、uh, to scale up that civilian component in the、uh, peacekeeping. Thank you. I'm going to give Megan the last question here.、Um, my question is somewhat along the lines of the gentleman over there, and、um, I had originally wanted to pose it to Ms. Giffen.、Um, I also had questions about the cultural dimension, but not in terms of the Millennium Development Goals, but more in terms of peacekeeping and stabilization operations. We've seen the benefits that、um, I, I hate to use the term traditional because there's the connotation there. I think indigenous might be more effective.、Um, indigenous institutions have in、um, rebuilding a country in Gachacha in Rwanda, and I'm curious as to whether. Um, the UN and other organizations are talking about the ways in which culturally appropriate、um, approaches to stabilization and peacekeeping can be、um, implemented. Excellent, Allison. We're going to begin with you and give each panelist who wants one minute because we need to go to a video.、Um, okay, quickly. I'm actually going to pass that 
uh, to Oliver <laughs> um, because he probably knows more about rule of law corrections and how they're working with traditional justice systems as my colleague who specializes in that does, but I don't. Um, on sequencing, I think this is really important. And I've been recommending a three-stage mandate where first you try and get some military on the ground for some quick um, uh, uh, security, and then you do better assessments for how and how you can be doing sequencing um, on your state building, and especially to make sure that it's being done in a way that doesn't reify um, atrocities or targeted violence or, or those types of conflict gains that have happened on the ground. Um, uh, and and so um, and I think that's being done now in South Sudan and CAR to a certain extent. Is that when the state really falls apart? Um, and there's high levels of violence, how you can focus on protection and security first um, and hopefully get things like the human rights due diligence policy really working and in place and then to start building back the state building components and institution building. And I'll just say one other thing is that um, I think this is a really opportu big opportunity for peacekeeping. I think some of the best work is being done right now within the UN Secretariat under people like Oliver and policy and best practices. Um, and uh, we have a real opportunity in places like Central African Republic and in South Sudan, even though there are real tragedies, um, to get peacekeeping to work better, not just at the top levels, but at the bottom. Thank you. Uh, I'll tackle the issue of uh, cultural um, uh, developments in the context of Millennium Development Goals. You are correct that uh, when we think about the Millennium Development Goals that were agreed 15 years ago, there was not a discussion about culture and the arts. Um, there are elements of culture that are being discussed in the context of the new goals um, uh, that will follow after 2015. Everything from ending, ending you know, cultural acceptance of uh, corruption, um, you know, and again promoting, as you mentioned, uh, indigenous, indigenous institutions that promote reconciliation, um, and uh, uh, and of course an, a separate goal on education itself. Um, I think I have not heard of a more explicit discussion about cultural uh, promotion and arts uh, in the terms of the new goals. And the two things that it would take are a driver within the UN system and a driver among a member state. So I'd have to probably do a little bit more research as to whether individual member states are raising these specific cultural and arts issues in the context of post-2015. And also uh, UNESCO is uh, the, the key driver. Um, uh, from a UN perspective, so. Thank you. Others. Okay. Um, I will uh, respond to a bit in, in terms of the better institutions question. And uh, as you know, it has been considered also in my research for a long time until, you know, I just uh, stepped into the research about G7+. Plus, and I found it could be considered as a uh, um, improved uh, pattern, even though it's now still shaping it itself. But I think, you know, uh, in terms of G7+, Plus, it's uh, uh, also have like two um, parties. One is the donors and the other is those recipient states. But in terms of the donors, it can be composed by whatever UN uh, agencies and OECD or even some private uh, sectors. And uh, I think the special part lies to the recipient states. Because, you know, this kind of framework emphasizes a lot of ownership of those states themselves, which means that, you know, the states will just they start their assessment first and then let the donors know what we need. And uh, it could uh, compose to be a better way to, uh, to operationalize. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll try to be very brief. Um, institution building, the question from, from uh, the professor in the front row. We've done quite a lot of work just in the last couple of years, actually, about how we could get better at, at the diagnostic part of, of your question. Um, it used to be called the state of the state assessment. Um, we don't use that language anymore, but it's essentially um, it recognizes that we're actually not very good as the international community at assessing the state of the institutions as we're, as we're entering. Um, and I very much include in that the traditional indigenous uh, institutions um, that exist, particularly in, in, in the more remote areas in, in every country where we, where we deploy. Um, we've worked very closely with the World Bank and some others um, to, to, to establish a diagnostic, develop a diagnostic tool that we're hopefully going to pilot in, in CR. I agree with Alison, CR is a nice 
it's a horrible situation, but it's a, it's a good case for us to, to try to um, uh, improve on what we've been doing, including through that. I don't think we're very good at having an overarching institution building um, strategy um, because we still operate in silos uh, based on different bits of the institution building mandates that we have, but um, we, can, we can maybe talk about that over lunch. Um, scaling up um, uh, civilian components, um, I wish I had a really good answer. Um, recruiting for Mali was hard. Recruiting for CR is going to be 10 times harder. Um, uh, we would be very open to ideas that we haven't explored. Civil affairs components are absolutely critical. Finding civil affairs officers that are willing to spend a couple of years in remote areas of CR is extremely difficult. Um, uh, we work with UNVs, we work with lots of other channels and, and, and mechanisms, but um, I completely agree. Um, getting those people deployed quickly is often more effective than um, uh, military components arriving six months later. Um, so we, we completely agree. My thanks to everyone on the panel. We're ending this portion a little bit early so that uh, AFP can show a video. As you know, for, for lunch, we're having a conversation with uh, John and Susan Collins Marks uh, about their work, and and they we have a prepared video which will introduce them uh, for those who don't know them and be a bit of a tribute to them. During some of the darkest days of the Cold War, John Marx had a vision that there had to be a better way to achieve a just and peaceful world. He understood that while conflict is an inevitable part of the human condition, violence is not. He saw the possibility of a win-win, non-adversarial world, and he founded Search for Common Ground to achieve it. Let me tell you a little about John, who has not always been a peacemaker. He first worked as a foreign service officer, including a spell in Vietnam during our war there. He was, like so many others, disillusioned by what he saw, but he wasn't discouraged. I met John during his journalism career, and then I watched in awe when he switched from provocateur to peacemaker. He started Search for Common Ground in 1982 and has tackled many problems, but he's always aimed for the big prize. Our focus tonight is on yet another aspect in the extraordinary evolving relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. If you find it difficult to believe that the CIA and the KGB may be on the verge of cooperating with one another in the near future, your instincts are probably right. Nevertheless, high-ranking former officials from both agencies have been meeting out in California this week at a conference sponsored by the Rand Corporation and an organization called Search for Common Ground. In 1993, John traveled to Cape Town to make a television series called South Africa Searches for Common Ground. After a day's work, he went out for a few beers with his South African producer, who asked John if he were married. I'm divorced, said John, but I'm looking. Looking for what, asked the producer. A tall, beautiful mediator, replied John. The producer said, I know her. And the next day, he introduced John to Susan Collin. Within 30 hours, they realized that this was it. There's something about um, a, a shared vision and a shared love going together. And for us, it was when we first met each other, is, it was that sense of, of the love that we felt for each other, of course, was just the overwhelming. Nine months later, they married, and Susan moved to Washington, where she quickly established herself as John's partner in running Search for Common Ground and in transforming conflict around the world. What's unique about Susan is this ability to meet people and present herself in such a warm, open manner that you're inevitably drawn to her. She makes you respect her and you can trust her. And that trust is just so important going forward in her work and in her life. Susan's also a spiritual person and she brings that dimension to her work in negotiation, mediation, and peace building. 
We share a vision. We have something we can talk about incessantly. Um, we are able to do work that complements what the other person is doing. We're able to combine the characteristics of two people, which makes us a much more powerful individual and couple. No one has done more to advance the field of practical conflict resolution around the globe than John and Susan Marks. And they've done it with initiative and intelligence, with head and heart, with passion and persistence to advance the cause of peace. John and Susan believe that the genius of search lies in the committed, gifted colleagues who share their vision. And the right people always appeared when the organization started opening field offices in such places as Macedonia, Burundi, and Angola, and when it launched a major initiative to improve relations between the U.S. and Iran. Here, for the first time, uh, I experience a kind of atmosphere, a kind of spirit, uh, in a conference, uh, in a gathering, which permits people to uh, open themselves up without reservation uh, and uh, speak out of their heart. So what do two presidents in Washington and Tehran do when they want better relations but are afraid the effort could blow up in their face? Well, they move carefully. And they turn not necessarily to diplomats, but rather to private individuals who hold no official position. At this week's conference, Iranian and American diplomats spoke in generalities. But it is someone like John Marks who is actually doing something. Marks organized the visit of American wrestlers to Iran in February. It was the first time the American flag had been displayed there since 1979. When the wrestlers returned to the U.S., President Clinton invited them and searched for common ground to the White House in order to signal to the Iranians that he wanted to improve relations. Today, SEARCH has grown into the world's largest conflict prevention organization, with offices in 34 countries and a staff of 560. Its largest program, which Susan started 13 years ago, is in the Congo. This is a countrywide effort to build peace and prevent sexual violence. It includes retraining tens of thousands of soldiers and police. We see the media as a really important and profound tool for working in conflict areas. For one thing, you reach a huge amount of people. And so we see it as a way of putting the spotlight on the uh, approaches to peace building that normally people get through dialogues or through a workshop, but then you're, you're, you're reaching 20 or 30 or 40 people. With the media, you can reach um, um, millions of people. Movies and TV around the world are saturated with images of violence and horror. But is it possible to use pop culture in a different way to promote peace and understanding across a country? It's for a new soap opera series that's taking on one of the most serious issues for Kenyans today, the hatred and violence that arise from tribal divisions. John Marks is the visionary behind the soap opera, The Team. Call it soap opera for social change. The key to peace is to be the peace we want to see in the world. And this is how we do it, by everything we think and say and do. So the answer to the question, what can I do, is such a simple one, is to live that peace every day in whatever our circle is of our lives. And in that way, we truly do contribute to peace. So given that peace is really about walking each other home in a peaceful way, about caring and compassion for ourselves, each other, and the planet, let's do it together. This gears you up for our lunch, and uh, thank, please join me in thanking our panel.